Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. So excited to see you. Um, there uh, should be captions available on your screen. Just wanna uh, flag that for folks that you should be able to select that on the right bottom of your screen if that's something that would be helpful for you. Um, so we're about to dive in. Um, and so folks who are joining, um, welcome. You're welcome to share your name, your pronouns, and where you are based in the chat. All right, I'm seeing someone based in Virginia, Arkansas, welcome. Yes, Virginia, DMV, okay. <laughs> seeing Maryland and New York, Boston, got people from all over Atlanta, Michigan, more folks from New York, Louisiana, Tennessee. All right, so excited to be here with you all today and share space virtually. Um, and I think we're ready to go to the next slides and get things started. Awesome. So here's just a little bit about um, the caption. So there should be a little button that says closed caption available. Um, if you have any difficulty, you know, uh, feel free to DM, you know, any of the hosts of the event. Um, and yeah, I think we're ready to dive in. All right, so welcome. Thank you so much for joining. I'm so excited to be here with you all to talk about the importance of reproductive justice in this moment. Um, I'm sure you are all very much aware of the terrible attacks on abortion access that are taking place. Um, and to build strong movements that center the most marginalized and can win real victories that will actually make abortion more attainable for any person who needs it, we really need to have a deeper understanding of what we are up against and to be grounded in theory as we take action. So now that more than ever with these attacks on our rights, it's really important to ground ourselves in radical and liberatory frameworks so that we know how to organize effectively. So we're really excited to kind of go over some of the core tenets of reproductive justice, what that really means for us and our communities. And yeah, I think I'll just pass it to Brea to go over some community agreements for our time together. Thank you. We can go to the next slide. Okay, so some community agreements today, we want to try to use I statements. Um, we recognize, recognize how your own positionality, race, class, gender, sexuality, ability informs your perspectives and reactions to the speaker. We want to avoid unnecessarily gendered language, especially when um, discussing repo justice, health, and rights. Um, I think there might be another slide or yes, there it is. Um, what is stayed here? What is said here stays here. What's learned here leaves here. Let's differentiate between safety and comfort, accept discomfort as necessary for social justice growth. Um, move up, move back, which basically, basically means be cognizant of the amount of space that you take up um, when you talk pretty much and you know leave space for others, but also take some space for yourself and actively participate by challenging yourself you know something in this uh presentation today or webinar today may really challenge your personal belief and it's okay to sit with that right like that's how consciousness raising happens and that's how we learn if you would like to add anything feel free to share it in the chat um and if you agree you can put that in the chat as well we can go to the next slide in the meantime though so um, let me just uh, introduce myself. My name is Bria Johnson, and I'm the Deputy Director of Organizing at Girls for Gender Equity here based in Brooklyn, New York. Hi, I am Kinjo Kiyama. My, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm the Director of Organizing and Campaigns at Advocates for Youth, and we train and support young activists all over the country in uh, doing organizing around reproductive rights and justice. I should probably also say what Girls for Gender Equity does. So for 20 years, um, GGE has centered the livelihoods of Black girls and gender non-conforming youth, making sure that they are at the center and also leading um, change in this country. And so I really encourage you all to go to our website if you would like to learn more about the work we do. All right, so. If you're here today, you are a part of our training series inspired by the incredible June Jordan that we are hosting at GGE. 
Today is the kickoff of that series. And as you can see to the left side of your screen, we'll be having a direct action in civil, be civil disobedience training with the Blackout Collective. Included in this training will also be a medic training. So it's direct action and medic training. The applications for that will go out soon. Stay tuned at, with our social media and you'll know when that comes out and we'll advertise it across all platforms. So if you found today's session, you will find the next one. We'll be hosting an abortion doula training. Um, we'll be having an intergenerational roundtable, redefining reproductive freedom. And lastly, we're going to have a self-managing abor abortions through herbal re remedies, Instagram Live. To be clear, this is not encouraging people to do something unsafe. It's actually going to be a session challenging misinformation about herbal care that we're seeing online and to give some facts and kind of information about the things that are being named online. So we just want to be clear about that. We are considering everyone's safety. Um, the number one question that we get is why June Jordan? And so before I answer that, I would love to play a video from her wonderful poem, I Must Become a Menace to My Enemies. I will no longer lightly walk behind a one of you who fear me. Be afraid. I plan to give you reasons for your jumpy fits and facial tics. I will not walk politely on the pavements anymore, and this is dedicated in particular to those who hear my footsteps or the insubstantial rattling of my grocery cart, then turn around, see me, and hurry on away from this impressive terror I must be. I plan to blossom bloody on an afternoon surrounded by my comrades seeing terrible revenge in merciless accelerating rhythms, but I have watched a blind man studying his face. I have set the table in the evening and sat down to eat the news. Regularly I have gone to sleep. There is no one to forgive me. The dead do not give a damn. I live like a lover who drops her dime into the phone just as the subway shakes into the station, wasting her message, canceling the question of her call, fulminating or forgetful but late, and always after the fact that could save or condemn me, I must become the action of my fate. How many of my brothers and my sisters will they kill before I teach myself retaliation? Shall we pick a number? South Africa, for instance, do we agree that more than 10,000 in less than a year, but that less than 5,000 are slaughtered in more than six months? Well, what is the matter with me? I must become a menace to my enemies. And if I, if I ever let you slide, who should be extirpated from my universe, who should be cauterized from Earth completely, law and order jerk-offs of the first, the terrorist degree, then let my body fail my soul in its bedeviled lecheries. And if I, if I ever let love go, because the hatred of the whisperings become a phantom dictate I obey, in lieu of impulse and realities, the blossoming flamingos of my wild mimosa trees, then let Love frees me out. I must become, I must become a menace to my enemies. Oh, that's my girl. That's my girl. That's my girl. <laughs> so if the poem didn't answer your question of why June Jordan, just let me give you a little bit more information about her. June Jordan was a bisexual Black feminist poet, writer, and, and educator. Um, an organizer, right? Um, and she grew, she was born in Harlem and she lived in Brooklyn. And all of her writings do tremendous things. But what I love the most about her writings is that she's constantly trying to incite something in us to fight back, to organize, to challenge power and to instill feminist values, right? So June Jordan was always trying to teach us what it meant to be a menace to your enemy. And that just basically means challenging power. So what we hope that folks take away from this entire series and from everything happening in the world right now is that when we say no justice, no peace, we really mean that. And so what does it mean to be a menace to anybody who is anti-reproductive justice? Sit with that question. And hopefully some of the information where you just learn what RJ is will help you learn how to do that today.
because y'all Mitch McConnell can't know no peace. Joe Manchin <laughs> can't know no peace. Let, you know, nobody can know peace, okay, until repo justice is achieved. <laughs> uh, we can go to the next slide. <laughs> Yes, exactly. I, I love that poem. So, you know, this is a, a presentation and a training, of course, but we also, you know, just sort of love to hear from everyone's perspective and sort of like where people are at and where people are coming into this Zoom room um, from. Um, so I'm just kind of curious if people, you know, want to share sort of in the chat, um, how are you feeling about these current attacks on abortion access and sort of like what you see going on? And what do you think when you hear the word patriarchy? And um, yeah, feel free to share and we can just kind of go off from uh, the discussion that's happening in the chat. I'm seeing, when I think of patriarchy, I think of oppression by white men. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, you know, certain people being prioritized while the rest of us are left out, marginalized and subjugated, absolutely. And I'm seeing, I'm feeling rage about these current attacks on reproductive rights. Absolutely, I'm right there with you. I think, you know, we all, uh, many of us in the repro movement knew this was happening for a while, but actually seeing it happen in real time is just, it's very very outrageous. Um, I'm seeing someone say patriarchy equals power over. Yes. I'm seeing someone say the patriarchy is suffocating. Patriarchy equals white terror. Absolutely. You're really onto something, Keisha. We will talk about that um, and in more depth. And I'm saying, I think of, I'm seeing, I think of power. Um, I'm seeing ash share abortion is something I didn't think I'd ever need, but it was also a possibility if something went unexpectedly. I'm so afraid and angry. Yes, that is so real. Thank you. Thank you all so much for sharing. Um, I'm seeing Black femicide, control, dominance. Um, I'm seeing disempowerment. Yes, absolutely. And we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, just the importance of taking collective action because none of us in this room are alone and feeling this way. And there's people, you know, all around the country who are also feeling similarly, seeing people say, I feel scared. Yes, that is very real power, unsurprised. Um, and seeing someone say it in Missouri as a Black queer woman, I'm over it and scared. Yes, thank you all so much for sharing. I'm, I'm right there with you. And I'm seeing um, folks breaking it down even further about, um, you know, just oppression based on misogyny, racism, heteronormativity, the gender binary, folks are feeling unsafe, angry, and yeah, so many people in power did not take these attacks seriously, even though the writing was on the wall and the right wing sort of said like what they intended to do, um, feeling fear for folks in states without access, um, a system, yes, absolutely, a system that is set up to lift up people, but uh, not, you know, it spells death for everyone under it. Um, yes, I thank you all so much for sharing. I really, everything that's been said um, really resonates with me. Um, and yeah, I think it is extremely upsetting, disturbing, outrageous, um, and frustrating. And I think, you know, this is, like I said, I think we're not alone in feeling this way. And a lot of people all around the country who are you know, right there with us as well, just feeling this frustration and rage and sort of like, how could we get to this point, right? Like, how could people in power do this to us? So we're kind of kind of talk a little bit deeper about these systems of oppression, where they come from, and how we can work collectively to fight back against them. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Thank you all again so much for sharing. I'll pass it to Bria. All right, so because this is an introduction, we just wanted to ground folks in a little bit of language that we might be using throughout this. Of course, if you don't know what a word means, you can always ask us in the chat and we'll do our best to make sure that we break it down for you because we want you to walk away with this knowledge, right? So first word is bodily autonomy, which is the which is the right to governance over one's own body, the right to kind of control your own body. Sometimes this term is used interchangeably with self-determination. Um, I'll let you decide how you want to use it. Um, trans misogynoir is the hatred of Black trans women and trans femmes. Uh, misogynoir is the hatred of Black women coined by Moya Bailey as a way to articulate the experiences of Black of being Black and woman or Black and gender oppressed. Um, intersectionality, this is a big definition, but intersectionality is a feminist sociological model or lens for critical analysis that focus on the intersections of multiple uh, mutually reinforcing systems of oppression, power, and privilege. And intersectional theorists look at how the individual experience is impacted by multiple systems of oppression and privilege. That includes race, gender, ethnic, 
ethnicity, religious ability, education, sexual orientation, sexuality, gender identity, gender expression, class, citizenship, age, and more impact in experiences. Let me look at the chat to make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay, yes, we can go to the next slide. Am I doing this one? All righty, okay. So the next term we're defining is patriarchy. So patriarchy is a form of mental, social, spiritual, economic, and political organization structuring of society produced by the gradual institutionalization of sex-based political relations, created, maintained, and reinforced by different institutions linked closely together to achieve consensus of a lesser value of women and their roles. These institutions interconnect not only with each other and strengthen the structures of domination of men over women, but also with other systems of exclusion, oppression and or domination based on real or perceived differences between humans, creating states that respond only to the needs and interests of a few powerful men. That is a very, very, very big definition. So basically what we are saying is that patriarchy is a system. Patriarchy is a gender-based system, right? And there are many different gender relations. It's not just cis men and women. Um, and patriarchy is deeply interconnected with all other structures. So if you know bell hooks, bell hooks coined the term and used to always say white supremacist, imperialist, capitalist patriarchy, right? She would do all of that in one to recognize how these systems are interconnected with each other. We felt like it was really important to ground you all with pa in patriarchy because what we're seeing that's happening in the world right now isn't just repo justice attacks. These are patriarchal attacks, right? Like this is a patriarchal structure that is trying to regain and consolidate power. So you can tell us in the chat any reactions or questions you have to patriarchy in this definition that we've given you. Someone said they hadn't heard the term gender oppressed until until uh, it was said earlier. Um, brief and powerful, thank you for sharing, thank you. Um, someone is feeling angry, but also grateful for providing language and clarity, yes. Um, I underestimated how much the spiritual aspect of the patriarchy has traumatized me. I did not feel human until I left the church, no offense to any religion. Thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, it seems all systems of oppression rely on each other from right supremacy to capitalism to ableism to patriarchy. I agree 100%. Okay. Um, I thought it was interesting to point out the mental and spiritual aspects of patriarchy because I think it's more overlooked than the mechanisms of patriarchy like the economic and political. I agree. All right, yeah, someone said that responding only to the needs and interests of a few powerful men describes everything coming out of the Supreme Court these days. Very true. Let's continue with the next slide. Um, so now let's get grounded in what reproductive justice is, which means that we need to get grounded in its definition and the fact that repo justice has always been black um, contrary to what some people believe. So reproductive justice is defined as the human right to control our bodies, our sexuality, our gender, our work, our sexual pleasure, and our reproduction. That can only be achieved when we have the complete economic, social, and political power and resources to make healthy decisions about our bodies, our families, and our communities in all areas of our lives, right? all areas of our lives. Reproductive justice is a deeply expansive framework. It cares about the totality of your being and your life and your community. The three pillars of reproductive justice are the right to have a child, the right to not have a child, and the right to parent our children in safe and healthy environments. I'm gonna say that again. The three pillars are the right to have a child, the right to not have a child, and the right to parent our children in safe and healthy environments. And so when a group of Black women came together in Chicago to coin this term, 
It was because they were largely all in agreement that abortion access or pro-choice rhetoric did not meet the needs of Black people because we were talking about something beyond just choice. So what I like to say is reproductive justice cares about the right to choose, but we also know that as a community, we deserve better things to choose from, right? You have the right to not have a child and you have the right to have a child, which means that we care about things like pregnancies that end up being aborted because a person simply couldn't afford it, right? What happens when a wanted pregnancy is aborted because of patriarchy and capitalism and so on? We care about that, right? So yes, you you had the right to choose and that is important because you self-determined for yourself in that moment, but we still have to look at the larger structures that inform the choices that we make. And that's why as reproductive justice organizers, we are constantly, constantly thinking about the material and the structural, right? Like what, who has the power over us <laughs> and, and how do we make sure that they don't, right? Um, Fannie Lou Hammer, a lot of people may know her as a prominent civil rights organizer and voting rights organizer. A lot of the things that is hidden about Fannie Lou Hammer's story is that she was forcibly sterilized like a lot of Black people and Indigenous people and um, people of color have been, both men and women, um, disabled people, queer folks, anybody considered um, abnormal or undesirable to the state has, has experienced some form of eugenics, right? And so for those of you who don't know, um, places like North Carolina had some of the most egregious eugenic policies that you will ever see in your life. And forcibly sterilizing women was a very common practice, and it's still happening today. So I encourage you to look up when anti-eugenic laws were actually implemented, and you'll realize we are a lot closer to that time than we think we are, right? A lot closer to that. And even what is happening in prisons, it, <laughs> you're, we're a lot closer. Um, even June Jordan. June Jordan was an abuse survivor. She also survived having very bad pregnancies that led her, I mean, um, very bad abortions that led her with medical complications. Um, and she was also a sexual assault survivor, right? And then she died of breast cancer. So even her story is a story of what, what would it look like if reproductive justice was achieved in her lifetime and what would have been different for her? I'm going to look at the chat and we can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so again, we're gonna keep we're gonna keep using the chat tonight. We would love if you could share how it would impact you and your community if everyone you know had reproductive justice, meaning everyone had the right to have a child, the right to not have a child, and the right to parent our children in safe and healthy environments. Someone said I would be able to have a child. Someone said Black folks could actually experience freedom. Woo, that's a big one. Better community support. Yes, that's really important. Collective care. Um, parents and children getting their needs met. Um, it might cut down on child abuse if parents were supported. Yeah, so you all are starting to vision and that's good. We want to keep that. And for the sake of time, we're going to keep moving but I love all the stuff that is coming through. Yeah, everything, Bria, you just said. I love what you said about like not having choices to choose from. Um, we just want to talk about, you know, sort of like where we see all these connections, right? There's no single issue. Everything is interconnected um, and understanding how different, you know, forms of oppression are connect interconnected is really important to be able to like understand how to fight back against them, right? So patriarchy doesn't stand, stand alone. It's inherently connected to white supremacy, capitalism, other forms of oppression. And we really have to tackle them all. And gender issues can't just be isolated from like everything else, right? And, you know, Black folks, other folks of color um, are experiencing multiple forms of oppression at once at the same time that are really connected in a system to tear us down. 
Um, reproductive justice means that people should have what they need to parent their children and to have healthy and safe families and sustainable communities, right? So when we think about like abolition, for example, and just sort of like the police state and police violence that's all around us, I think some people would sort of see that as like, oh, well, like, what does that have to do with like reproductive rights and justice? But of course, everything is connected to each other, right? Like if you think about the fact that repro justice means people should have what they need to parent their children and have healthy and safe families, of course, prison stands in opposition to help healthy and happy families, like putting someone in a cage is not a solution, right? So even though sometimes people may see different issues as separate, they're understanding how they're all linked can help us better um, be situated as activists and organizers to really push back and fight for more robust changes that our communities desperately need. And we can go to the, the next slide. Yes, I'm seeing, I'm seeing criminalization of folks who've had miscarriages. Yes, arrest of um, people organizing for abortion access. And yes, environmental racism and how that is totally connected um, to people being able to have a child. Absolutely. Um, and so just want to, you know, I, I really love Bell Hooks um, and just sort of like all the writing she's done about um, patriarchy and um, yeah, just sort of like different systems of oppression. Um, and she had this really great comment on sort of how a uh, majority of individuals enforce this sort of like unspoken rule that demands that we keep the secrets of patriarchy, right? And a lot of this is connected to when the culture refuses to give everyone even easy access access to this word to name the system, right? Patriarchy. Um, and most, we're all sort of indoctrinated into the system of institutionalized gender roles from like a really young age. But I feel like um, we don't really see it in everyday speech as she as she so comments on. And uh, how can we organize to challenge and change a system that cannot be named? Um, and I think this is just really important to remember. I know Bell Hooks also came up with the phrase, I think as Brian mentioned, um, like the white supremacist, capitalist, heteropatriarchy. And I know in her writing, she spoke about how when I say this full term aloud, people always laugh. And I'm like, well, what's funny, right? Like, so I just want to acknowledge sort of like the importance of naming the system that we're up against. If we cannot even talk about it or not even name sort of like what we're all experiencing what we're all sort of indoctrinated into to believe and to uphold and to act as if, as if you know patriarchal violence is just this normal thing and just the natural state of the world um I just think it's really important to name what we're up against and we can go to the next slide to kind of talk about um reproductive justice and what that really means so I think it's just really important to um sort of acknowledge uh, reproductive justice and intersectional feminism, both frameworks that were created by Black feminists. Um, it's very different than the mainstream perception of what feminism is, right? Like there's a lot of people where if you said feminism, like they may just associate that with, honestly, with college educated white women. And of course, like that is just a very flawed perception, some of which is to do with the racism that people experience in mainstream feminist movements. Um, but reproductive justice is a really holistic framework, right? Like if you have a legal right to something on paper, but in reality, you have no way to access it or like around you, whether that's because, you know, a clinic is really far away or you don't have the money that's needed. Um, that's not really a right, right? Like it's not just about having rights. It's about having access. Um, it's not that rights aren't important, but it's just like people need actual access to things connected to their reproduction and bodily autonomy. Uh, and patriarchy does not stand alone. It is inherent connected as we're you know sort of all discussing to white supremacy capitalism and other systems of oppression and we have to tackle them all and um gender issues can't be isolated and i think a really big way to think about it for me in terms of this difference between like reproductive justice reproductive rights intersectional feminism and mainstream feminism is is the goal to be equal to white men or is the goal to end and eliminate all forms of oppression and domination because i would say those are actually two very different ways of looking at the problem and how we want to solve it right so intersectional feminism is acknowledging the violence all around us and um, wanting to end oppression overall, not just saying, I hope to get a few rights. And so I'm willing to throw people of other identities who are different than me under the bus, just so I can achieve those rights and gain a little bit more power and status in society, right? 
And of course, abortion, contraceptives, vital, vital to everyone to be able to access um, for free. Honestly, I think that's also something that's really important that we need to talk about is we need universal access to all forms of health care. And of course, abortion and contraceptives are health care. Um, so it's not, those are vitally important, but it's not just about those things. It's about ending systems at, of domination and of oppression. And every form of oppression has clear connections to reproductive injustice, right? So everything is linked and and we really need to understand those links to be able to push back and sort of name what we're really seeing and what we're experiencing as people living at the intersection of multiple different forms of oppression. I'm seeing someone share in the chat that white women have been trying to get the rights of white men, but that leaves everyone else out and the rights of white men are based on the oppression of others. Yes, exactly. We're not trying to step on anybody's back so we can have a crumb of rights. We're trying to end oppression overall. Absolutely. I think we can go to the next slide. Um, so yeah, I think just to sort of summarize where we're at, white supremacy and gender-based oppression and all other forms of oppression are inherently linked, right? Like we can't just say like, oh, like we just want to fight for abortion access, but like, you know, this police state should still remain. Obviously that, that stands at odds with each other because who are the people who will be arresting people who um, have abortions in states where it's no longer legal, right? Um, and attacks on abortion access are taking place at the same time as attacks on queer and trans rights. While the Supreme Court has overturned Roe versus Wade, we have seen a terrible onslaught of homophobic and transphobic state level laws all across the United States, whether that's from um, policies like the don't say gay state bill in Florida or other things that are just sort of like attacking the rights of LGBT people. Um, the right wing fascists, like they are attacking bodily autonomy in, in as many ways as we as they can. And we really, as a movement and as people who care about reproductive justice and believe that every person should have control over their own body and self-determination to do what is best for them, um, we really need to be vigilant in opposing racism, classism, and transphobia in our movement, right? Because again, we're not just trying to get some rights and then step on other people to get there. We're trying to lift us all up together as people who um, whose bodily autonomy, autonomy is being attacked by the state daily. Um, and I think, you know, I'm an organizer and I think it's really vital to take action, to take collective action, whether that's taking to the streets, doing things like political education in your community, mutual aid. It, action is vital, like we'll not get changed without action. However, um, you know, there's people who've been uh, organized around these things, naming these systems for decades, for generations, right? So it's important to also, while taking action, have a deeper understanding of things like reproductive justice and like intersectional feminism, because theory and action really go hand in hand and strengthen one another. Um, and I think we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so <clears throat> one of the questions that I always get from people who are new to RJ is just trying to understand the difference between terms they've heard before. So you might have heard the term reproductive rights, or you might have heard the term reproductive health, and then you know the term RJ, and you're just trying to figure out what is the difference. They're all interconnected. Um, you know, reproductive health can include, it includes, but it's not limited to mental health issues like fibroids, um, got gynecology issues, fertility, things like that. Um, reproductive rights can be abortion access, birth control access, gender and sexuality rights, whereas reproductive justice is kind of more liberation, total lives, self-determination. Um, the way that I honestly like to break it down so that we, we have clarity as organizers is just because a person cares about reproductive health does not mean that they necessarily care about reproductive rights. Just because a person is operating in the framework of reproductive rights does not mean that they're doing reproductive justice. And it's important to understand those subtle differences because it becomes clear when it's time to organize and it becomes clear when you're making demands who is kind of where, right? For a lot of people, their framework stops at just rights because they inherently believe in the state. Um, and for others, it goes way further than that. And they understand the limitations of a rights only framework, right? There is a difference between every four years, all of your rights being on the ballot and every single election being the quote unquote most important, important election of your time versus <laughs> reproductive justice being achieved, right? Those are two completely different things. Um, there is a difference between caring about pro-choice and just abortion access 
and then actually caring about a person or community's ability to self-determine, right? The state could codify Roe today. They could do it today. They could say, we, we have codified Roe. It is a national right. Stop yelling. You're fine. And I guarantee you a large portion of folks who have been out re recently would leave the fight because that's as far as their, their commitment goes. But what reproductive justice understands is Roe was the floor and abortion access is also the floor. We got a lot of problems, right? <laughs> and so it's just really important to understand that. We can definitely go to the next slide. Um, one of the things I also forgot before we get into this, I'm going to drop a link to um, a very powerful brochure that a lot of you may not have heard about, but it is the African American women are, um, hold on, uh, African American women, we remember basically we are for um, reproductive freedom brochure. Um, I love this brochure so much. I think it came out in 1994. A lot of people have never heard of it, but what they define what reproductive freedom means to them, they said the right to comprehensive age appropriate information about sexuality and reproduction, the right to choose to have a child, the right to good affordable health care to assure a safe pregnancy and delivery, the right to health services to help the infertile achieve pregnancy, the right to choose to not have a child the right to full range of contraceptive services and appropriate information about reproduction, the right to choose to end an unwanted pregnancy, the right to safe, legal, affordable abortion services, the right to make informed choices, the right to easily accessible health care that is proven to be safe and effective, the right to reproductive health to make our own reproductive choices. This was a brochure that was signed and created by folks like Billy Avery, Shirley Chisholm, um, Eleanor Norton, Maxine Waters, and so many other notable names um, came together and put this brochure together. And I'm always so floored at how many people have never heard of it, right? <laughs> um, this was a big moment in history and we're still begging for all of those things today. So let's just talk about some landmark cases. You're going to have to Google the details of these cases on your own because it's just not enough time in the world. But some cases that relate to reproductive justice. So we have the Connecticut case, which was a landmark case in which the Supreme Court struck down a state's prohibition against prescription se prescribing, selling, or using contraceptives, even for married couples. So this is kind of where your right to privacy kind of came in was with this case where basically um, the court held that the Constitution guarantees the right to privacy when individuals make decisions about intimate and personal matters such as childbearing. That's important, right? Um, you know what Roe versus Wade was? It was the, t the case that challenged the Texas law prohibiting all but life-saving abortions. Um, the Supreme Court basically said that that validated the constitutional right to privacy. So I want to be very clear. The Supreme Court rulings never said you had a right to abortion, per se. They said you had a right to privacy. So with Roe falling, this essentially means that the right to privacy is also in the air right now. What does the right to privacy now mean is what a lot of legal scholars are trying to explain to us. Um, on the right hand side, you can see some other cases that are also really important that I encourage you all to look up, like Pam Parenthood versus Casey, um, all of those things. Look those things up and understand them, because when the courts are talking about legal precedents, they're talking about a lot of these cases. I also think it's important for you to look these things up so that you understand the fact that reproductive rights and justice has been under attack for a very long time. And this is just the legality side, uh, side of it, right? We understand that culturally, we got a lot of uh, unnamed things that are also under attack. We can go to the next slide. All right, so um, I'm gonna pass it back 
to you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I think, you know, I just want to emphasize again, the importance of taking collective action, whether that looks like, you know, plugging into your local mutual aid network, um, joining a political organization that explicitly is pro-abortion, um, and just doing what you can to like connect with other people in your community who share your same values. You know, the time is now, you know, um, attacks on our communities are really escalating. And we have really seen, I think, in the past couple of years, especially just the failure of institution to meet everyday people's needs. And we have also seen regular people just like us coming together to meet one another's needs, to demand more than the crumbs that we are offered every day. So even if we are, you know, far apart, you know, I know people are in the Zoom room from all across the country, all of this, right? You know, if you really look at the data of like how many people believe uh, Roe versus Wade should not be overturned, for example, like we are in the majority. It's just that we are not united and organized as people who really believe in bodily autonomy, right? So even if we're apart, um, all of this, if we really were to all connect and fight back, puts our targets in a vulnerable position. And now more than ever is the time to build this momentum and fight for a better world. Um, and I would really hope that people are hearing this and wanting to like learn more and think deeper about reproductive justice, about what you know fighting against patriarchal violence really means to you. Because now is the time to pull together all the resources, people, other organized groups on our side to demand what is right. And I just want to say there is no one coming to save us. We are everything we need and we are the people we are looking for. I mean, we can go to the next slide. And I'm seeing some, if for Richmond folks, um, somebody dropping a great link in the chat. So um, I just want to share sort of a few ways, if you're kind of like looking for ways to take action um, and maybe, you know, are newer to the movement and um, want a place to start, here's a couple of options that I'll share in the chat. So first, um, if you want to learn more just about organizing, how it works, um, there's our Youth Activist Toolkit, a comprehensive guide to organizing, whether it's in your school or your local community. And if you're kind of looking for, you know, specific demands that you could make of your school, your city, your state connected to reproductive justice, we have a margin to center toolkit that will kind of give you some ideas and places to, to start. Um, and then um, if you want to um, actively support other people in your local community who need access to abortion, we have a youth abortion support collective. So if you click on that link and you sign up, you'll get training and resources to kind of learn like, okay, my friend or someone else who lives near me needs an abortion. How can I show up for them? So, um, you know, learning and theory is amazing and it's vital for us to succeed as a movement. However, you know, I really encourage you if you have not done so to take action, to plug in and to join up with others in your local community who believe in the same things as you and who believe that, you know, the attacks we're seeing on abortion access are wrong and should no longer stand, right? So again, many ways to make change in your community, organizing, mutual aid, volunteering, direct service, joining local practical support networks, which are like networks of people who help others access abortion care. Um, so yeah, uh, I think we're gonna, you know, discuss some further ways to do that, but this is a place to start if you're kind of looking for ways to fight back against patriarchy and reproductive injustice. We can go to the next slide. We've talked about so much right now, so we definitely want to build in a five minute break. Um, Yes, we always try to build in breaks, okay? We want people to be able to take in the information and you can't do that without some breaks. So thank you all so much. And we can go to the next slide. So me and Kenjo are gonna take a break from talking for a little bit. And in order to do that, we're going to bring up one of my favorite people, Jelani Owens, who is a part of Fill the Gap in NYC. Jelani uses they, them, and theirs pronouns, is a non-binary, queer, Black, Latina, Black, ooh, Latinx <laughs> with both Puerto, Puerto Rican and Black American ancestry. Since March of 2020, Jelani has managed the Fill the Gap project, a resource distribution network providing free menstrual products, emergency contraception, and parenting supplies to the persons living in Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx in New York. Also an essayist, Jelani's work, written work explores race, gender, queerness, disability, and their intersections, and has been featured in Refinery29, uh, the Black Youth Project, you name it. If you don't follow Jelani, you're really missing out. Just a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant mind. 
Um, they're also receiving their JD from the School of Law. So I just want to bring up Jelani. <laughs> Hello, thank you so much. I feel the same way about you where I'm like, wow, like the moment, like they're the moment. <laughs> thank <you. laughs> yeah, thank you both um, for having me. Truly so humbled to be in this space with such brilliant minds. Um, and so I was hoping that I could just talk a little bit about some of the work that I do um, and also just in general, like some reflections on the moment um, that we're in. Uh, and so I wanted to share a little bit about me um, and like where I'm coming to RJ from, since I think that that tends to be helpful. Um, and so for me, and like just to, like a brief content warning for some mentions of some triggering things, like I don't want you to feel like there's a person on my screen and I have to listen to everything I have to say, definitely prioritize um, what you need to feel good and come into the space in the ways that you want to. Um, so I came to reproductive justice work um, as a survivor of sexual violence. Um, when I was in undergrad. Uh, and so for context, I was like a four hour, five hour drive from where I grew up. Um, and so I was completely by myself for the first time. Um, and like a lot of other um, children of color, like my mom was making my doctor's appointments, my mom was making my dentist appointments. I was like, I've never had so much agency in my life. Um, and now this really, really hard thing uh, is happening to me and I have no idea what I'm supposed to do, who I can tell. I definitely did not want to tell my family. Uh, and so I was fortunate enough that um, student organizers of years past um, have been reproductive justice organizers on my campus. And so um, Planned Parenthood had like a plan van that would come to my campus every other week um, where they would do like express care, like pregnancy tests, SDI and HIV testing, um, and then could refer you to the actual clinic if you needed other things. And so fortunately, I was able to kind of like honor my needs and honor what I wanted to do um, and also get that express health care. Um, and within that setting, that was the first time that I had ever been like, hey, I actually experienced this. Um, I don't know what to do, but I was told that you know what to do. <laughs> and I was really able to rely on the support and the care that I had. Um, and so from there, um, I've done organizing with like Planned Parenthood. I've done organizing um, that's more grassroots and based in my community. Um, but it really all kind of started from this one experience that kind of put me on the pathway to radicalization. Um, and so from there, um, as Ray mentioned, I um, just got my JD, I just graduated in May. Um, and so I'm studying for the bar exam right now, um, <laughs> which is a journey when the Supreme Court gets rid of all the laws um, <laughs> that exist at the same time that you're supposed to study them. And so when I first went to law school, oh, thank you guys so much. Um, it has truly been a journey. Um, if anybody has law school questions, I'm most happy to answer them and either dissuade you or encourage you, <laughs> whatever you're looking for. Um, but yeah, when I went to law school, um, right out of undergrad, it was in part to find closure and like why I found myself in the position that I did. Um, and so like I, at the time, obviously was a black gender oppressed survivor and I wasn't going to talk to a lawyer about what happened to me. Didn't want to go to police about what happened to me. Um, I didn't even want to tell like mandatory reporters on my campus what happened to me. I just, those didn't feel like options. Um, and knowing that the person that who had done this to me was also a black man, I also just felt really uncomfortable relying on this system that I knew would most certainly put this person in prison and if not in prison, just torment them because that's what the state does. Um, and so there was a part of me that was kind of looking for the closure of like, why does this happen this way? Like, what are the mechanics of this system that, it's called the criminal justice system, but I'm not, I'm not getting the justice part of it, just the criminal part of it. Um, and so naturally, um, studying law did not help me find the rhyme or reason. It was just, this is white supremacy and this is what it looks like. This is what it does, like take some prisoner, it's, this is what it's like. Um, and so that wasn't acceptable to me at all. I was like, okay, well, if it's as clear as this from somebody who studies it and it was clear before I got here, um, there has to be more than just complying with it. Um, that can't be all there is for me. Um, and so in 2020, um, so the gap um, was something that I created uh, in New York, just in my little apartment <laughs> during the pandemic. Um, and so Fill the Gap was born from just seeing the observation that came from like in my own community where everybody was talking about how there's no toilet paper on the shelves, no Clorox wipes, no gloves, no Max, all important. Uh, but I was seeing that there was no plan B and there was no menstrual products. There were no tampons. There was no formula. There was no diapers. Um, and for like a lot of like the younger folks in my community, 
um, they had pointed out that like, well, I go to school and that's where I get my pads. That's where I get my tampons. That's where I get my sanitizer. I've never had to have it at home. I don't know how to get it. Everyone, everyone has bought all of it all the time um, to a point where there were even like these white, like middle-class folks who are coming um, about, who are just like coming to like, these poor neighborhoods and like also buying out all the things they had. Um, and so I was just like, well, I have some, like, do you want some? Um, and so initially it was kind of just informally us being like, well, I have some of this, you have some of this. If we just pull it together, we got enough. Um, and so sometimes we did, sometimes we did it. Um, but from there having this like bigger resource distribution product um, project kind of going on during COVID, what a lot of us were just like, the government really does not care. They really just left us here <laughs> while this pandemic starts. Um, and we just have to figure it out. Um, and so at the time too, I like my family, I have a lot of like immune compromised family members. I myself um, am like vulnerable to COVID in different ways. Um, the same for folks in my community. So there was also just this feeling of everything is off the shelves. And when it is the only people who are really able to kind of like go to whatever store at 6 a.m. and like duke it out for some Clorox wipes are folks who don't have those same vulnerabilities and are not disabled. Um, and so it was also like, how do I ship things to you? How do I drop things off? How do I do grocery shopping for you if that's what you need too? Um, so it became this network of folks who, based on where they were, whether if they were um, undergraduate students trying to like leverage whatever resources they could get at school, um, if they were working and then they worked somewhere that like was distributing PPE, like also bringing that too. So that's kind of how we built ourselves out. Um, and so I offer that just because I think that a lot of folks now are also in a place where we're feeling like the government is abandoning us or like the legislators abandoning us, like the things that are supposed to do things so that I don't have to worry about them are not doing them. Um, and that's not to say that everybody is shocked or can't believe this is happening or is like finding out about white supremacy right now today. Um, or even to suggest that our pre-COVID, you know, normal was not oppressive because it absolutely was. Um, but still, like, I think you can hold that with also the realization that what we're all kind of experiencing right now, like compounding with the grief of, of living through COVID um, and living through like access needs in that way, like is a lot. And we're also like in a country and that has a culture of just not allowing, not acknowledging grief, not giving a space to process grief, like the pace of capitalism, of, of being productive, of the fact that we're supposed to just like watch the Supreme Court, like drop decisions every day. And we're supposed to like go to work or something and then come home and like make dinner and then like watch TV maybe. And like, you're supposed to do that as if these people do not have any power. <laughs> um, it's just like ridiculous. Um, and so I kind of offered that just to say that a lot of people are like experiencing this grief and there just is not space for where you're supposed to put it. Um, and even though I find a lot of comfort in kind of going back and being like, well, I'm gonna scream about it in the streets or I'm gonna um, host a program or I'm gonna do political education. Like I'm not one of those toxic positivity people that's gonna be like, you should never feel hopeless ever because that means that you're not organizing hard enough. Or if you feel hopeless, it's cause you haven't read enough books um, <laughs> because that's just not realistic. Um, you can read all the things and still feel really small, still feel really powerful, powerless, still feel like whatever it is is bigger than you. Um, and that doesn't mean you're not organizing enough. That doesn't mean that you don't care enough. That doesn't mean you're not invested enough. Um, so I absolutely don't want folks to feel that way just because I know that a lot of social media can also make you feel that way. Um, it can make you question like, how come this person has all the spoons to go to this march and I want to sit home and cry <laughs> about the state of affairs? Um, that's absolutely real and valid and you can do both. Um, and I also think that like with that being said too, um, is that a lot of us are just like different positionality as well. Um, and so some of us have more capacity to do certain things or look like we're showing up in certain ways um, just because of who we are. Like if you are somebody who is in a state that is much less hostile when it comes to abortion and contraception access, of course you feel much safer going out in the streets and protesting because you ultimately tomorrow when you wake up, like if that protest isn't that successful, like you'll still have whatever rights it is that you're talking about um, versus some folks who might be in hostile states who may be undocumented or who may um, work somewhere where like they know for a fact, like if I'm on TV or if I get arrested, 
I'm going to get fired because I'm not going to be able to go to work tomorrow. Or who may be immune compromised and may be like, I can't go to these marches because none of y'all wear masks. Um, the police are, who are going to arrest me are not wearing masks. Um, and it's just not safe enough, vaccinated or not. Um, and so I also just want to name that too, um, to not immediately see everything that's happening at the pace it's happening and assume that something's wrong with you for not um, being in the mix in the way that everybody else is. Um, that also being said, um, I know that everyone is grieving and that everyone is really afraid and that everybody is really unsure about what we're supposed to do and when we're supposed to do it. Um, but I think that that's given license to a lot of bad analysis and a lot of folks feeling vindicated in saying whatever it is that they want to say as loud as they want to say it um, because they're hurt or targeted. Um, and so I feel like part of what Bray offered throughout the presentation and Kendall as well is that by virtue of being impacted by something like doesn't mean that you have all the tools you need. You have to be grounded in political education when you do those things as well. Um, and so an example of being impacted but not having the analysis is like all the white women running around in um, handmaidens, tails, outfits, um, impacted for sure. Like if you have a uterus, impacted for sure. Um, but the other things are not present or falling into place. Um, or folks who are hosting demonstrations but are not, don't have a mask policy, aren't giving out PPE. Um, folks who are chanting at marches, but the chants are all pleased for the legislator to come and save them. Um, people who are having posters that are inherently trans exclusionary um, and constitute trans erasure and are really antagonistic, um, where people are having demonstrations where they're talking to the police as if the police are there to help you. <laughs> um, and like on the subject of transphobia as well, like whether it's erasure or just antagonism, I just want, particularly cis women like in this space to know that like it's still very painful and hurtful um, to have to try and occupy repro spaces with you um, and to try and make space for your grief and understand that for a lot of you are afraid and don't really know <laughs> what there is to do, but to then still have to come into that space at all but especially to come into that space and be treated as though I'm like an ally, like a cis woman, like support group um, and not also there fighting for my life. Um, <laughs> and like, that's not to say like, that you are not also impacted, but like you're not the only people impacted. Um, and thinking about where the framework of reproductive justice comes from, um, there should just be so much more care and space given to black folks of marginalized genders in this space. Like knowing that that's, like whose backs you're stepping on in particular, like it should give you pause and should make you uncomfortable um, and should be enough for you to self-correct. Like I shouldn't have to also then be like, hey, have you considered that your weird like uterus like chant thing that you're doing like makes me feel uncomfortable? <laughs> like, have you considered um, that maybe this is not the way? <laughs> um, and, and like to that point as well, like so much of what for me, like fuels like my feelings of hopelessness and despair um, is that in a lot of what I'm seeing, it just feels so clear that like black women, women of color, queer and trans folks, disabled folks, poor folks, immigrants um, are gonna experience irreparable harm from the moment that we're in. Um, not just the federal level of, of what's coming out of the Supreme Court and the precedent that, that sets, but also at the state level. Um, and folks are still kind of doing work that perpetuates this myth that abortion is this issue for like cis white women who are college educated, middle class, US citizens, non-disabled, um, when RJ itself is necessarily a movement about folks who are at the margins, um, having to be so vulnerable in this moment and for my vulnerability not to be truly seen <laughs> or recognized. Um, like it's really disorienting as well. Like it feels like a, like a cultural gaslighting of knowing like how high the stakes are and no one is is acknowledging it. Um, and so it's as painful as with the things that like our conservatives are saying of the laws that are coming out of state legislators, like, like the counter suits, like it's the same for me. Like it feels that way, even though you may be like, well, of course I'm not your enemy. I'm, I'm at this march with you. It doesn't really feel that different to me because I still have to fight the same fight, but like I'm in a space where I was prepared to have my guard down and I had to immediately put it back up and I, maybe I didn't have the space to do that. Um, and so again, like it's not that white women or cis women aren't gonna be impacted. Absolutely will be, but it's the fact that anti-abortion sentiment in general, historically has always been white supremacy, um, ableism, homophobia, transphobia. It's also been about settler colonialism and it's a tool in imperialism as well. Um, so it isn't about like to make space for me, there has to be 
like a complete denial of your reality instead. Um, like those aren't the choices <laughs> that we have. Um, it can be about a movement of collective action that can do really, really stressed. Um, and I think that like, it's really, really critical that moment to have that kind of consciousness because abortion bans um, and like the Dobbs decision are really about also in part maintaining a white majority by forcing white people to have babies, <laughs> um, by saying that white people cannot not do that because that's the agenda. <laughs> um, and it's in part why the Supreme Court is also saying that they're gonna go after the right to contraception, same-sex marriage, interracial marriages. Um, it's also in part why conservatives are targeting trans youth the way that they are to make sure that trans youth don't have access to puberty blockers or um, affirming healthcare. Anybody who has a reproductive capacity to maintain a white majority should be doing that. You can't do anything else. You, that's what your, your call to action is. Um, and so if you're seeing it for what it is, how can you possibly say that the very people who are going to experience genocide and who my womb is like being used as like a tool of war to carry out their genocide don't belong here. Um, like, how can I say that my space can't be safe for them? Um, and it should offend you that there, that there are people in Congress and Supreme Court who have the audacity to think that you will comply with that demand um, more than it should enrage you that I'm, you know, being divisive or whatever it is. Um, and like, for proof of like how true that is, like a lawsuit came out of Alabama, I think this week, using the language and the Dobbs decision already to try and pass laws that are forcibly gonna detransition trans folks. Um, and so they are very intentionally attacking bodily autonomy in these ways. Um, and so we have to respond by centering those communities because it'll be deadly for those communities if we don't. Um, and so I think that it definitely requires like, a really big shift in how you think about things um, and how you talk about them and what your strategies are. Um, but if you're somebody who really is angry in this moment, really is feeling hurt in this moment, you'll do it. Um, and like a lot of people online, unfortunately, because <laughs> I'm really, really online, um, love to be like, well, that's so easy for you because you're the most impacted. So you don't have to do any work. Um, and I have to, which like, okay, like, why are you jealous of my oppression. Um, but even still, um, there are plenty of ways that I'm not the most vulnerable, um, even in conversations about transphobia. Like, I don't experience trans misogyny at all. Um, I experience misogynoir, but not trans misogyny. Um, like, I don't have an experience of forced sterilization or the humiliation that comes with being turned away from clinics of not having anybody to ask about how testosterone might interact with my birth control or things of that nature. Um, but I still show up for those folks because I care about this. Like this is what I think about when I wake up and what I think about when I go to sleep for better or for worse. <laughs> um, and so I think that if this is really what you wanna do, like you'll do it. And of course you're gonna make mistakes. That doesn't mean that you're not. No one can know everything with the pace of, of how everything is happening even right now. Like, of course, there are gonna be things that you leave out, um, but there'll be mistakes instead of you know, full out erasure. Um, and so I think that's really, really critical that we talk about the communities that are hurt the most, um, even if it means making space when you're grieving or when you're hurt too, because um, there's no monopoly on, on pain. <laughs> Thank you so, so, so much. I feel like you've touched on just so many different things, the connection to ableism, um, gender, the question to gender oppressed folks. I just think that there are just so many layers and levels to this. Earlier, someone said that, I think they said the fourth pillar is um, something around gender and sexuality self-determination. And I definitely agree that like a huge part of repo justice, at least that we're seeing in this iteration is also challenging that cis heteronormativity and saying that, you know, gender determination is also critical to this fight. And there's no way to not talk about gender expansively um, and be for reproductive justice. There's just absolutely no way. Um, I feel like I have to tweet every five minutes with Amy on the Supreme Court saying and doing the things that she's doing. Why are you saying things like men need to mind their business or men shouldn't be able to make laws about women's business why are why are we saying that with the amount of women in leadership positions right now who are causing harm I think it's time for a better analysis right we aren't just talking about identity reductionism we are talking about power 
And one thing Miss Bell Hooks used to say, and people used to get so mad at her was, she said, anybody can be a patriarch. Anybody can be in solidarity with patriarchy, right? Doesn't matter what your gender is, you can uphold patriarchy. And we're seeing that every single day with the different types of people who are harming us. We see it with Clarence Thomas, who's clearly upholding white supremacy and patriarchy. And we also see it with Miss Amy, who, who her reasoning was we need a what robust amount of birth of babies for the economy. She straight up told you what the agenda was. They're not lying to you. They're not performing. They're telling you, this is the agenda right here. More babies, more workers. More babies, more white people. More white people, more white supremacy. They're very clear. And so that's why I think it's it's important for us on this fight to also be clear. And I think to get clear, we got to put them signs with hangers down. We got to put that no uterus, no opinion sign down. We got to put that women's only down, put it down and pick up a better analysis. <laughs> or we just going to keep having the same problems. <laughs> Um, and so I will pass it to Kenjo if you want to say anything before we move into the next activity. <laughs> yes, honestly, I don't know that I have much to add. I think, you know, both of what you said, um, yeah, it's just a spot on. And I think, yeah, I think we just really have to get clear on like what we're for and what we're against and make sure that our analysis is actually rooted in reality in order to like effectively organize for change. Um, yeah, I think we're going to do a little visioning activity if somebody is down to share the screen again. Perfect. So we talked about a lot, you know, a lot about oppression, injustice, and something that I think is really important when organizing is to just really have a clear vision of the future that we're fighting for, right? If we only can see the present and we don't have sort of like the political imagination to envision something that could be better, it becomes really hard. And honestly, at times, you know, sort of like demoralizing to fight for something better. So we're gonna do a short visioning activity. If you are interested, you can close your eyes if that's something helpful and we'll have a little discussion. Um, so if we go to the next slide. So let's take a trip to the future. So imagine it is the year 2050 and the patriarchy has suffered a huge blow. The misogynists, patriarchs, white supremacists and capitalists are in hiding and the reproductive justice movement has succeeded. And so this means that every person that you know, you, everyone in your community has full autonomy over their body, has free access to all forms of healthcare, any form of healthcare like abortion, gender affirming healthcare, and people are able to receive that universal healthcare without experiencing medical racism, misogyny, transphobia, or any form of discrimination and stigma. Can you go to the next slide? Um, and so in this year, 2050, um, care work, like domestic labor, raising children, is fully compensated and acknowledged as something that is deeply valuable to society. All people who want to have children are fully supported and are able to raise these children in safe and supportive environments. Comprehensive sex education, menstrual products, contraceptives, and abortions are all available to any person who needs them without cost or without judgment. Every person is housed and fed. We've worked to undo the effects of climate change and adopted ways of living in harmony with the earth and environmental racism is eradicated. We've been able to kick, kick the police out of our communities and redirected their money from their prisons to support our communities. Reparations have been paid to people of color for centuries of racism and exploitation. And we have found ways to deal with conflict, harm, abuse, and violence in ways that center the survivors, prevent more violence, and get to the root of the problems. In imagine that in the year 2050, the intersectional feminist movement has cultivated a culture of care instead of a culture of domination and violence. We can go to the next slide. So, you know, I, I just sort of want people to sort of think about what this would really mean for you, um, what this would really mean for your communities if reproductive justice was something that was actually achieved. And you're welcome to share either in the chat or aloud, just what would this, what would this impact be, right? Like, how would life be different for you 
for your communities in this future with reproductive justice? And are there any things that came up for you um, as you envision this future? And you're welcome to share any words or images that come to mind. I'm seeing someone say um, actual rest. Um, and I think if anyone wants to speak aloud, I believe you can click the little like raise hand feature. Um, and um, I'm seeing, sorry, you're slow. Um, I'm seeing, I would be able to finally breathe. I felt free being able to live without fear. The word that keeps coming to mind is joy. That would be a joyful future. Hoping I live to 2050, living with true agency. My partner could come out as trans femme and she would be my wife without fear of losing our marriage. The vision reminds me of Lucille from Awakwe Emezi's novels. Community with love and freedom in the center. Yes, I felt more at ease. I found myself smiling throughout this. Life would be full of love. This kind of imagination is very necessary and we need to see that alternatives are possible. Yes. So I think joy and freedom, living without shame, enjoying our lives fully and the lives of those we love. And I saw someone say, at first I couldn't even think of what I would do. Making more art would be lovely. Comprehensive sex education for their school and community. Um, I felt my stomach unclench, like freedom from fear. Um, other folks sharing a good night's sleep, peace. I would be able to be perceived and seen the way I see myself. I'm seeing someone say, I just pictured everybody hanging out in the park, relaxing, a world where Black children are protected. Absolutely. I feel so much more control over my life. Yes, that is so real. Thank you, everyone, so much for sharing. I'm seeing international cooperation. Yes, absolutely. We didn't discuss this today, but I think, you know, um, having a more internationalist lens and just sort of thinking about not only this context in the United States is really vital, and there's a lot we can also learn from movements in other countries. Thank you all so much for sharing. Um, I think we can go to the next slide. And I hope that you, you know, just sort of carry um, these feelings with you as um, we, you know, organize and fight for a better world. Um, I just, I know we're a little bit slightly ahead of schedule. I just want to also see if anyone has any questions. Like, are there any things that are coming up for you about like organizing for reproductive justice, what reproductive justice means that are like, you're feeling unsure about, uh, you're welcome to share in the chat or to come off of mic if that is something that you want to do. Right. Okay, if there's no questions, oh, no, I can see the question. Um, I think I will pass it to, um, will the re recording be available to re-watch? I, I believe yes. Yes. Um, We'll make it, sorry, Kenja, we will make it available on our um, Repo Justice site over at GGE, and I'll make sure that we email it to everyone who came today. Awesome, thank book you. Book recommendations, that's a, always a good question. I recommend looking up the name Loretta Ross and reading her um, reproductive justice book. Um, Dorothy Roberts' Torn Apart is also a good one out right now. And then Treva Lindsay's America Goddamn, if you want to learn more about patriarchal violence. Um, do you have any book recommendations, Kendra? Um, honestly, I think the Dorothy Roberts one you shared was the only one that came to my mind. Um, so yeah, I think everything you share is perfect and I don't have anything else. And I'm seeing other questions of, instead of saying women is the best phrase people with uteruses or is there another phrase? I mean, if other panelists, you know, have different opinions, you know, I totally welcome that. I think sometimes I'm just like, we could just say people, um, you know, people who need abortion, people who deserve access to reproductive health care. Um, and I, I don't know, I feel like as a cis woman, like I feel very frustrated, I think with TERFs and people who are sort of like pushing back against us just saying people instead of women, because I feel personally, that so much of misogyny is just like dehumanizing us. So I think just saying people who need abortions, people who need access to birth control, it's like the best, like, I'm, I'm just like, we're human. And part of the reason we're having to fight so hard is because like, we're not seen as fully human. So I think um, I would say people who need abortions personally. Um, and then I'm having trouble seeing other questions and yeah I'm seeing also the point of like some people have hysterectomies and may not um have a uterus so that doesn't actually encompass um 
people who need abortions. Um, are there resources about for speaking about abortion with children? Yes. Um, Advocates for Youth has a YouTube channel called Amaze, and I will try and find that, but it has basically um, topics that are very like age appropriate for people who are much younger. Um, and I believe some of the videos are about abortion, so I will go and find that link for you. Right. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I'm seeing um, an elder panelist. Also feel free to jump in. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to deal with my chat. I, I see, I don't want to take up space, but how can white women and white queer people use our privilege to protect and uplift black women? I don't want to reinvent the wheel. Just push it up the hill. Yeah, great question. I mean, I feel like there's many things. I feel like listening to what people of color are saying, whether that's in activist spaces you're currently a part of or sort of reading um, some of the things that were recommended by um, thinkers of color, Black feminist thinkers, and also just, you know, trying to see other perspectives outside of your own. And also, I think with systems of oppression, I think there's a lot of brainwashing and indoctrination that we all have to go through to kind of be like fine with the systems and violence all around us. So I think really questioning the things you believe, where did you learn them? And how can you change any problematic narratives in your head to be something different? Because I think all of us have a lot of unlearning to do, especially those of us with more privilege. So that would be my, um, my recommendation. I wanted to also just elevate that, oh, Okay. Um, no, I saw Brian. I was like, oh no. Um, just because anything on my screen changes and I get distracted. Um, but something that I think is like really, really underrated um, is just seeking out what folks around you are already doing and seeing how they've already articulated how they want support. Um, like I know with Fill the Gap, like we'll be like, hey, like we're going to show up in Brooklyn at this intersection. We're going to give out menstrual products and food or whatever it is. Um, and so like, for me, like as like a black person doing this work, it's either donating like monetarily or itemized donations, um, coming out and helping us set up or take down, um, volunteering to like drive or help me on the train because I usually have like five thousand plastic containers of like pads and sometimes men say weird things to me on the train and I'm like, do you want one? Like, <laughs> like just let me like it's New York City like there are people with like the weirdest things on the train like don't bother me, um, and so I think it can be really easy ways like that like I. Think that it also feels like insurmountable sometimes when you're kind of thinking about these really big structures and you're like what am I supposed to do um but sometimes it can just be like well what does this person put into the universe and said like what supporting me looks like I agree I agree usually the asks are there and usually the acts are very clear uh, so just always try to look out for that especially if it's a very particular organization or grassroots organization that you're trying to support. Let me look at the chat. Okay, it doesn't look like there are any more questions. So we're gonna give you all 30 minutes of your time back. And we are just so, so grateful. Oh, we have a closing reflection. Okay, good job. Do your thing, let me shut up, hold on. <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry, You you got it, you got it. Okay, you're more than likely to close out with a reflection. Um, you can, or you can share it out loud if you want to. Something you're curious about, something that challenged you, something you're taking away for today, and that'll be our closeout. So thank you all so much for joining us. It was truly a pleasure, and please look out for more events on Repro Justice from GGE. You can always support our work because we definitely need it. <laughs>